Please welcome Lou Oberndorf. Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> this time of um, this season of awards, when somebody gets up on stage, they pull out a piece of paper and they have to thank everybody. They thank their family, they thank their agents, they, they thank their friends, uh, uh, they thank their therapist. Um, I, I, well, I guess, I'm, I guess I've been, for my British friends, gobsmacked by all of this. Um, this is extraordinary. And it's a real honor for a whole range of people and a whole family of people. Uh, by the way, uh, I want to congratulate the society because they finally found a way for me not to have, have to hold on to something and not wave my arms around like that, which you're used to seeing me do. But they didn't, they didn't stop my leg, so I am going to walk around a little bit. You, you start by talking about family and friends. When we started Medi some 20 years ago, one of our mantras was that we were going to create a family. But it wasn't just a family of employees. We did that very diligently. But it was really a family of users, clients, friends. So that family's here. Uh, I've forgotten some of your names, and I apologize as we walk up and down the hall. You know, when you, get, when you become a pioneer, I guess that means you're really old. And, uh, you know, something goes, goes with you when that happens. But we, we passionately felt that, that, that we were a community. And we continued to uh, honor that as, uh, I believe, the successor of Medi, CAE Healthcare. And they're here. And I want to thank Robert uh, for bringing your team here and sitting up front uh, uh, for honoring us today. I meant what I said in that message, and you've heard, many of you have heard me talk from this stage in the Obendorf Lecture introduction uh, about the risk uh, of success, as I mentioned in the video. I believe that what we've accomplished, the society and industry, is nothing short of, short of extraordinary. Um, Jeff Cooper and Others uh, that are here are true pioneers. You can remember the days in Society for Technology and Anesthesia where the exhibit floor was two large card tables. Look how far we've come. The society was uh, basically the Society for Technology and Anesthesia. Look how far we've come. Both the industry and the society have grown together and have fed each other. And that's extraordinarily important going forward as well. Uh, oh, I just remember, I better thank my wife, Rosemary. <laughs> I didn't want to get to the introduction and not do that. Uh, she was a true partner. In fact, all of the senior executives in the early days at Medi and even up to the latter part of, of, of Medi uh, were all hired by her. And think about that in terms of business when you're a small startup, high-risk venture to attract the kind of quality and professional people that we brought into this company, to take that chance. So from the very beginning, we were taking a risk. When I mentioned in the film about the early adopters, the pioneers, took enormous career risk. Adam Levine is here. Ron Levy is here. Uh, Hal Dorr is here. I see a number of you, and, I'll, I, and I apologize if I don't uh, get all of your names. But in those days, for, for uh, anesthesiologists, for deans of nursing, for the military, to take this kind of risk and adopt this technology was, in fact, career-threatening or career-promising. Look how far we've come. Look how professional this 
organization, this family, is we have together changed the face of medical education. I tell the story that if you were to enter medical school, let's say 25 years ago, you would have entered an educational system that I guess was 100 years old from John's, the early days of Johns Hopkins and even farther back. If you were to go into nursing school in the same period of time, you were to be taught in the manner that had been used for generations. You cannot enter a professional medical educational institution today, I dare say anywhere in the world, that you will not encounter this experiential learning. So in that regard, you are all pioneers. And you continue to innovate and continue to advance the science of experiential learning. Because simulation is extremely important, but as I've said many times, it's a method towards education. And I will just close by reiterating what our twin passions were always at Medi, and they continue to be with our family foundation today. We had twin passions, education and technology. Technology we understood back in the early days of Medi, from my days in the defense industry. We were comfortable with technology. We didn't know anything about education, healthcare, we had to learn that, but we were passionate, passionate about education. Our foundation today is still passionate about, found, about education. And that's why, uh, that's why we started the Obendorf Lecture Series here, as we have with SESAM in Europe, continually to bring you new ideas and to challenge you. This is incredible, and I want to thank you all, even on behalf of industry, for this recognition, because it's not just for me, and it's not just for Medi. It really is the society's way to tell industry that you are important to us. You are important to us, and we value you. Thank you very, very much. Please welcome the 2016 Obendorf Lecture, Allison Levine. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, you guys heard a little bit about some of my outdoor adventures. And uh, as you heard, I'm also an author. Uh, my book's called On the Edge. Uh, my favorite Amazon review said, all the suspense of into thin air, but without the depression. <laughs> and that's actually a photograph of me on the cover. People think it's an illustration, but it's a photo of me climbing Denali in Alaska, which is the highest peak in North America. And people ask me for advice on that mountain all the time. They always say, Denali, it's really cold and steep. Give me some advice. So I just say, uh, stay left. But what I thought I'd do in the time we had together is just share with you guys some of my favorite lessons from the book, focusing on the American Women's Everest Expedition. So this is a climb that took place in 2002. In 2001, I got a phone call asking me if I wanted to serve as the team captain for that trip. And initially when I got the phone call, I said no. Just because, I mean, even though I'd climbed the highest peak on six continents and had done a lot of other climbing in between, I still really felt like, you know, I wasn't good enough, I wasn't experienced enough, and it just felt like way more challenge than I was ready to take on at the time. Well, then came September 11th, which really changed the way that so many of us look to the future. And for me, one of the messages that came from that was to not let fear stop you from doing the things that you want to do. So I ended up calling this woman back and agreeing to serve as the team captain. And at the time, I still really didn't know if I had what it was going to take to get up that mountain. 
But I knew if I didn't step up to the plate and try, that I would never find out. And I actually ran across this quote when I was contemplating the whole thing. It's a quote by the first woman who ever climbed Mount Everest, Junko Taibe. She's from Japan. And she reminds us that it's not just about technique and ability. It's also very much about willpower. Holy crap, we're really going. And then it hit me, and the thought of going from sea level to 29,000 feet above sea level absolutely made my head spin, because the process of climbing this mountain is not exactly straightforward, right? Because you're helping your body acclimatize. And for whatever reason, we tend to think that progress has to happen in one particular direction. But that's not the case. Sometimes you are going to have to go backwards for a bit in order to eventually get to where you want to be. So don't look at that backtracking as losing ground. Look at it as an opportunity to regroup, regain some strength, so you're better out of the gates the next time around. Backing up is not the same as backing down. And that is one of my best lines, so if you're gonna write down anything, <laughs> probably that one. Now it's made more complicated by the fact that there are these big, huge open crevasses everywhere where you could fall hundreds of feet to your death. So they span these rickety aluminum ladders across them so you can get from one side to the other without falling in. So between the big, huge moving ice chunks and the ladders and the open crevasses, it is a very scary part of the mountain. But it's also where I learned one of the best lessons about leadership and about life, really, which is this. Fear is OK. Fear is OK, you guys. It's just a normal human emotion. Complacency is what will kill you. These are the boots that we wear. Once we leave base camp, they cost about $950. But if you break that down, it's only $95 a toe. <laughs> so if you want to keep all of yours, you suck it up and buy these boots. All right, building relationships, networking, uh, forming partnerships. This is one of the most critical parts of successful climbing. I think it's the most overlooked. I need the people around us to feel obligated to help us is that you have to be able to take action based on the situation at the time and not based on some plan. Because whatever plan you came up with last year, last month, last week, even that morning, your plan is outdated as soon as it's finished when you're in these environments that are constantly changing. So forget about being hell-bent on sticking to your plan. You have to be much more focused on executing based on what is going on at the time. But storm clouds started to come in. So at that point, we had to make a very tough call. So just beyond this point here is the summit of Mount Everest. And this is where the first American women's Everest expedition turned around to go down. Trust me when I tell you that turning around and walking away from the deal is harder than continuing on. But when you're up there in these mountains, you have to be able to make very tough decisions when the conditions around you are far from perfect. And you have to think about how every single move you make is going to affect everybody else around you and not just you. So it doesn't matter how much blood, sweat, and tears you personally put into something. If the conditions aren't right, you turn around, you cut your losses, and you walk away. It is a 10,000-foot drop to my right and an 8,000-foot drop to my left. And I really couldn't see too far in front of me at all, but sometimes I think you don't need absolute clarity in order to just put one foot in front of the other. So that's what I did for about another nine hours. And I'm happy to report that on May 24th of 2010, I actually did make it to the summit of Mount Everest. Oh, thanks, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I made it to the summit in honor of my girlfriend, Meg.
So take that, JP Morgan guy. <laughs> and uh, for me, that summit was the completion of what's known as the Adventure Grand Slam, which is climbing the seven summits, the highest peak on all seven continents, and skiing to both the North and the South Pole. I think there's a couple dozen people in the world now who've completed the Grand Slam. And that photo was actually on the front page of the New York Times sports section. So people would see the photo and they would ask me, you know, man, what was it like to go back to that mountain eight years later after everything you had been through, fight your way through the storm, and finally stand on top of the highest mountain in the world. And I can honestly tell you, it just wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> because think about it for a second, you guys. You're only up there for a few minutes. I was up there for a half hour. That was considered you know, a long time to be at the summit. I promise you that plenty of better, stronger, more skilled, much more deserving climbers and Allison Levine didn't make it that day for whatever reason. Most of them turned around because of the weather. People that stand up there for a few minutes are no better than the people who turn around just short of the top because it's not about spending a couple of minutes up there. It's about the lessons you learn along the way and what you're gonna do with that information to be better going forward. Uh, if I had to sum up all the lessons I've learned on all the expeditions I've ever been on, sum everything up into one slide, that would be it. That triangular shadow that you see, that is the shadow of the summit of Mount Everest. And we snapped that photo shortly before we started to descend during our failed summit bid in 2002. That shadow, that image, is pretty much permanently ingrained in my brain because for me, that is a reminder that sometimes things are gonna go your way, sometimes things are not gonna go your way. That is part of climbing, it's part of business, just, you know, part of life. But you have to be willing to get out there and push yourself on these peaks day after day, even when it feels uncomfortable. I mean, especially when it feels uncomfortable. And you've got to be able to weather the storms if you're ever gonna have an opportunity to enjoy this kind of view. And you don't have to be the best, fastest, most skilled climber to get to the top of the mountain. You just have to be absolutely relentless about putting one foot in front of the other. And I know I did my absolute best when I stood on the summit of Mount Everest on May 24th of 2010. But I also know that there are always going to be more mountains in my future. So tomorrow, and every day thereafter, I have to be even better. Thank you so much for having me, you guys, and um, enjoy, oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. I'd like to thank the Academy. Oh, no, thank you, you guys, I really appreciate that. You are